A Body to Die For, A Stay in Check Mystery, Book 1. Author Grant Michaels, Publisher Stonewall Inn Press, Narrator Eric Ost. Chapter 12, How High the Moon. Sunday morning, I was awakened by a gentle tapping on the cabin door. I got up and spread the plaid curtain slightly to look outside. Beauty's face was pressed hard against the window. He used his lips, nose, and tongue to make writhing pink shapes on the frost-colored glass. It looked like a bad artistic moment from a porn film. I opened the door and said sharply, What do you want? I thought I'd take you to Jack's climbing school. Who says I want to go there? I could tell what you wanted last night, he said, his brown eyes lively, even at that hour. Judy, I'll find what I need on my own. Thanks. Then I'll come along for the ride. Judy's tanned skin glowed and his black hair glistened in the early morning sun. I knew he was flirting and I was vaguely irritated at myself for responding so easily. I said, don't you have anything else to do? Now that Roger's gone, I don't have a job. Why not? I used to help him. With what? Just doing things. That sure sounded like a houseboy duties to me. Judy went on. And school doesn't start until next January. I surrendered. Come back in half an hour, I said. I have to shower and get dressed. Want some help? I smiled. Maybe another time. You still don't trust me, do you? You tie me not, Judy. I told you I was sorry. I didn't know what else to do. His eyes looked and sad for a moment and then brightened quickly. I'll come back in 30 minutes. When he left, it was 7.30 and true to his word, as the second hand completed its 30th tour on the face of my trusty times, Judy was at my door again. This time, he had a bag of food with him. Let's have breakfast in your car, he said. I know a good place on the way. The place Judy knew about had a spectacular view of the famous El Capitan. I pulled the car off the road near the base of the awesome pale granite monolith. Judy had brought two completely different breakfasts for himself, a gorgeous glazed Danish pastry, all buttery and flaky, filled with apricots and raspberries and almonds, and for me, one very beige bland granola bar. Why, I said plaintively, why not just two danishes? Judy answered, from what you said last night, I thought you wanted health food like Roger. No, I wailed, I thought you ate health food with him. I did, but I hated it. I'd always sneak off to get the stuff I really liked. Now, I don't have to do that. Oatmeal for me it was, then. I tried to enjoy it, for Roger's sake at least. We set off for the climbing school, the one owned and operated by Roger's buddy Jack. Judy knew the way and guided me easily. On and off we talked about life on Bally and life in Boston. From what Yuli said, people in Bally seemed to embrace nature, to love it, and cooperate with it. I thought glumly of life in Boston, where we seemed in constant contest with it. Just as we approached the school, Yudi yelled, Stop here! Then he opened his door and suddenly jumped out of the car. You go without me. I'll meet you when you finish that with Jack. He closed the door and waved me off. I was about to ask where we should meet, but he disappeared magically among the trees, just like a nature boy. I drove on to the climbing school and left the car in the gravel-covered parking area. There was only one other car there, an old Chevrolet coup from the mid-fifties, intact but poorly maintained in the bright sun. The once gleaming black paint now had a dull matte finish with bluish streaks, and the heavy chrome was pitted and peeling with rust. The school was a small wooden shack. Through its open door, I heard the buzz of country western music from a radio inside. I knocked on the door frame, but no one answered. When I called out, Hello? A voice called back. In back. I walked around behind the shack and saw a man about 15 feet up above the ground, grappling the underside of a horizontal projection of overhanging rock. He looked like a gigantic fly defying gravity and creeping along a ceiling. 
Just practicing my bouldering, he said. Don't get much chance during tourist season. I watched him amazed. What can I do for you, he said as he carefully crept and turned his body around to face me upside down. I, I'm trying to find out what happened to my friend Roger, Roger Fairbrook. The man stopped wrangling with the rock and looked down at me with his head tilted oddly like a praying mantis. He had short cropped gray hair and about a week's growth of grizzled beard. Who sent you? His friend. The little Falapino. He's from Bali, actually. Who cares where he's from? Can't figure why Roger ever got mixed up with him. He has a certain charm. That what you call it? Charm? His upside down face sneered. Plain old queer to me. And if, as if to add dramatic flourish to a statement, he let himself fall. No, I heard myself yell as he dropped through the air, but he landed easily and upright on his strong legs. It's okay, he said, grinning. Do it all the time. He walked toward me with an extended hand. Name's Jack. Jack Widgear? Folks call me Wacky Jackie. His strong, wiry body appeared to be in its forties, but his skin was already so weather-ravaged and I imagined he wouldn't look much different in twenty years. I shook his hand. His grip could crush anything easily. My palm came back covered with white powder. Chalk, he said. Needed for keeping a dry grip on the net rocks. Gets real sweaty up there. I wouldn't know. Never climbed. I shook my head emphatically. Then how you know Roger? College buddies, I said, already feeling his abridged syntax affect my own speech. Huh? he said with great doubt in his small, shifty eyes. Didn't know he went to college. He began methodically packing his gear. I said, I was wondering if you had any idea why Roger went to Boston recently. He looked up at me with a suspicious glance. Far as I know, went to climb old Man of the Mountain. That's what I heard, but he didn't take any climbing gear with him back east. Isn't that strange? Nah, pick up what he needed there. He stopped organizing his gear and faced me. His shifty gaze met my steady eyes. Rumor says Roger got himself killed back there. I nodded. It's true. That's why I'm here. He grunted. You a cop? I shook my head no. He said, Roger never got to climb the mountain. No. Too bad. He was a great rock man. And good dream material, too, I thought soberly. Jack, I heard that slide on Washington Column really bothered him. The man bristled. Little pansy tall you that tell you that. Can't trust him, you know. Imagination runs wild. I've often been accused of the same thing. You're not like him, are you? Does it matter? Guess not. You don't live here, at least. That was a cheery welcome, wagon and attitude. I persisted anyway. Why did the slide upset Roger? Don't know nothing about rock, do you? I had a collection when I was young. Wacky Jackie laughed. Best way to learn is to get on them. Doesn't appeal to me. There it was again, the contagious speech pattern. Take you on an easy slab. Probably love it. Most guys end up hooked on the buzz that they get. Come on, you're already wearing sneaks. Get ya by on an easy slope. No, I said, backing away slightly. I'm fine right here. He hoisted the coils of ropes over his shoulder. Search your cell. You want to talk? You come to my place and my place. He jerked his thumb toward the cliffs overhead. It's up there. They looked extensively high and far away. Thanks, but I'm sure we can talk just as easily right here. Suit yourself, he said again and headed toward the shack. I saw my opportunity walking away. Wait, I yelped. Yeah, he said turning. You said an easy one, right? I asked tentatively. What choice did I have? He grinned. Sure, you're gonna love it. He went into the shack and brought out a nylon web belt. Put this on. 
He pushed it into my belly. It had metal rings and pins and clips hanging all around it along with hanks of nylon rope. I attached the belt around my waist. I felt like a telephone lineman. I thought you said we'd be on an easy one. We will. Just two pitches. Pictures? Pitches, man, pitches. That's the climb between two flat places. Why not just say slope then? Nah, slope is different. Slope is... Mm, slope is... Slope is the whole thing. So, many pitches make a slope. You got it. Hey, you're smart. Thanks. But if it's going to be so easy, why do I have to wear all this stuff? Always gotta have some friends with you, no matter how easy the climb. Friends. That's what we call the safety gear. Cause when it saves your life, man, it's your friend. Then the guy named Wacky Jackie looked me over and winked. Besides, he added, I like the way it looks on you, he cackled. Better roll up your pants, too. Why? Makes moving easier. I did as he suggested and carefully rolled the legs of my baggy khakis up. He approved heartily. Get him up higher. Yeah, like that. Hey, good legs. Some people say. I noticed, though, that he wasn't wearing the same kind of equipment. He'd foisted on me. When I asked him about it, he said, I get the clips on my belt here. He proudly showed me the metal hardware around the heavy leather belt on his jeans. For the kind of climb we're doing, this'll hold just fine in an emergency. Uh, emergency, Jack? Don't worry, kid. No one's gonna fall. Hope you're right, I said doubtfully in his vernacular. Let's go. I was weary of the enthusiasm, but I wanted him to talk, so I humored him. I figured I would find out what I wanted before we started the actual climb. Then I could back out of the last minute. Besides, I had no intentions of ruining my new Ikru leather sneakers, frolicking about on the rocks. I tried to question him as we walked, but all he said was, Gotta be quiet now. Going to church. The rocks are like the church. My plan to talk now and back out later obviously wasn't going to work. We arrived at the base of a steep hill of smooth granite. Close up, it didn't look threatening, but it didn't look easy to climb either. Jack took a rope and passed it through one of the metal rings around his left. He attached the other end of the rope to one of the rings on my belt. Now we're safe, he said with a wink and a laugh. He turned to begin the climb on the wall of rock. He said, watch me go up. Then, when I'm there on that ledge, I'll give you the signal to start. Just do it the same way I do. Keep your hands and uh, feet flat on the rock and your fanny in the air, and don't look down. Sounded easy enough. I just wasn't prepared for how smoothly and deliberately he moved, crawling quickly on all fours up the slope. When he was halfway up, about 30 feet, he called back to me. See how? Yeah, Jack, but I'm thinking I'm changing my mind. Ah, come on. You don't want me to drag you up here by the rope, do you? Uh, no. He continued climbing up the rock to the first ledge. He attached the safety line to a rock up there, then pulled the rope so that it was taut. Okay, he called down. You climb up now. Don't worry. I got the rope secured. My moment had come. So I launched myself up the rock, if nothing else. I've got good legs and feet, so I used them to clamber up the granite, the way Jack had done. It was easier than I expected, especially when the extra grip my new sneakers provided. I pulled myself up onto the shallow edge where Jack was, then stood up to survey the scenery with him. We were probably 60 feet from the ground, and even at that elevation, the view of the valley was different. The granite felt warm and strong, almost friendly. It's really beautiful, I said, unspoiled. I hope it never changes, Wacky Jacky said. Still some Holdings down there. Holdings? Are they related to William Holden? Hell, we were in California. Wacky Jacky made a face. Holdings and Holdens. I shook my head. 
I don't understand. What's that? Private land, said Wacky Jackie. The owners are still holding it. Holding, I thought, in holdings. Still didn't make sense to me. You mean there's private land here in a national park? He nodded. Sure, but it's protected, right? I mean, they can't build on it or anything, can they? All kinds of rules are supposed to protect it, but you never know. I imagined some dreadful condo project with swimming pools and tennis courts and wireling fences. That would be a tragedy, I said, looking out over Purple Mountain's majesty. Old, old fight, still up in the air. Then Wacky Jackie winked at me again. I was hoping it was a nervous habit and not a courtship ritual. Let's get going, he said. One more pitch. But you're the anchor now. He positioned me like a wedge between two rocks. Now, don't move till I tell you. Why not? So's in case I fall, man. I don't go no further than where you're standing here. Oh, I said, great. Now, I had my life and his to worry about. He began climbing the second pitch, which looked much steeper than the first one. The simple flat hand and foot technique that had worked earlier no longer suffer sufficed. Jack yelled back as he climbed, Watch me! Look where my hands and feet are going. You're gonna copy me. Fine, I said, but I detected a serious note in my tone in his tone. When he finally reached the ledge at the top, he secured the rope again, then kneeled down to me. Okay, your turn. Put your hands and feet where I put them. Just stay relaxed and alert. Sure, I thought, but my hands had become sweaty. Just waiting, watching him go up before me, I took a deep breath and headed on the granite slab. I tried to mime the method Jack had used to get up to the second pitch, and for most of it I was fine. At one point, I lost my footing and slipped back a feet, few feet. I felt myself grappling madly along the rock, but then the safety rope stopped me down my downward movement. Y'all right? Jack yelled. Just testing the line, I yelled back but I thought I'd died and been reborn in those seconds. Now I knew what these rock climbers were after, that surge of life after death energy. They got where they didn't die, and people call the things I do unnatural. But the real moment of truth came near the top of the pitch, where I would have to pull myself up onto the ledge. The rock became vertical for a few feet before curving slightly outward from the wall up there. I didn't quite know where to make my next grip, and I made the idiotic decision to look down. I saw what I was over a hundred feet from the ground. All at once, my guts got light, and an unpleasant tingle spread across my shoulders. I closed my eyes, mantra time. Then I heard Jack yelling, What's going on? Hey, ain't no time for a nap. I opened my eyes, but there was no way in hell I was going to move. He hollered instructions from where he was kneeling securely on the ledge directly above me. One hand up here. Come on, guy. Let's go. Do it. I think I'll just stay here for a while. Can't. Gonna wear yourself out squeezing the rock like that. It was true. I was holding on so tightly that the fingers on both my hands were white and trembling already. He said, come on, fella. I got, on the, I got you on the safety line. Just put one end up here with me. Help me. Better if you do it yourself. Damn you, I thought. I don't have to prove I'm a man this way. This was probably supposed to be some kind of rock climber's rite of passage, but all I knew was I hadn't learned anything about Roger, and now I felt I was on the verge of plummeting 50 feet to the first ledge, then crushing another 60 after that. Safety rope or not, the valley didn't seem so beautiful now. Wacky Jackie continued coaxing me. One hand up here, palm down. He patted the ledge above me, as if it to make it more homey. Move it up here, smooth and easy. Okay, Buster, I'll be a man in as casual a gesture as I could. Manage, dangling 100 feet above the ground, I relaxed one shaking white hand, reached up high above my head, and slapped it palm down onto the ledge above me. Good! 
good, he said, beckoning me with his fingers. The other one, come on, buddy. Moving my other hand was going to be worse. Though, because even if I dared to move it, I'd also have to shift both my legs at the same time. At that one moment, all my weight would be supported by the lonely hand, which was securely grappling for dear life up on the ledge. Jack coaxed me. I took a big breath, then reached and grabbed with everything in me. Finally, I had both palms on the ledge, wobbling in terror. Now, just walk up the rock, he said. No way, pal. A baby could do it. I'm telling you, one foot in front of the other. I tried inch by inch to do as he said. He cooed softly. That's it, boy. Easy does it. Come to Papa. Papa Schmakwa. Now what? My ass was hanging out onto the air, and my legs were bent so that my knees were up near my chest. He said, Big breath, boy. Ready? Help! I gasped. Jesus! He yelled. Look at that big old rattlesnake nipping at your butt. It was do or die, so I did. I pushed down with everything I had in me and scrambled my legs up onto the ledge. I collapsed on the narrow ledge, breathless and speechless. I was home safe. He laughed. You really got pumped there. Good thing you didn't fall your first time up. Might have ruined you for climbing. Not to mention living. How you feeling, he asked. Alive, I gasped. That's the rush. You gotta like it when you, then you want more. Where's that snake? Wacky Jackie laughed loud and long. Ain't no snake. Fooled ya. Then he knelt down beside me and spoke low. You know what'd be real nice now? A double martini? I mean something that it, that you know how alive you really are. I'm feeling pretty alive right now, thanks. He murmured. We lit off up here. What? It's great. Here on the rocks? Sure, come on. I'm fine, thanks. I'll just rest for a while. Suit yourself. I'm gonna. He stood up, faced away from me, out toward the vast wilderness from behind. I could sense him unfasten his jeans and open them. He muttered to me, Hey, don't get me wrong. I'm just having a little fun. It's all right, Jack. Do what you have to do. Just don't get the wrong idea. Not, not at all, Jack. People are always spilling their procreative juices around me. I could sense him unfurl himself from his white jockey shorts. I tried to ignore him and concentrate on the valley below, but I couldn't help sensing him next to me, teetering at the rock's edge as his body swayed in anticipation of the impending release. It was grotesque. I mean, my ideal of kinky sex is satin sheets at the Ritz. It was then that I noticed how scuffled my new sneakers had gotten in the skirmish to get up on the ledge. Damn, I thought. I leaned forward to examine the damaged leather, and while doing it, I accidentally moved the safety rope attached to the belt on Jack's jeans, which were already slipping lower on his hips. I don't know how it happened, but... The minuscule tug on the line must have been just enough to alter his precarious balance. It was as simple as, now you see him, now you don't. I heard him yell at exactly that moment. I felt the line spring taut next to me. Fortunately, he'd secured the rope, so he didn't fall far. I looked over the edge and saw him hanging upside down in a stable of demi de chevelli. His shirt had fallen over his face, so... All I could see was his torso, his white jockey shorts, his legs, and his jeans, now gathered around his ankles. He wasn't moving. Jack, I said, are you all right? From under the shirt, his voice sounded frightened, but under control. Is the safety line secure? I checked it on the rock behind me. Yes, it is. He spoke with care. Listen, my belt is slipping from my jeans. If I move, I'll lose the safety line. I fall on my head, I'm done. You gotta help me. He was right. The place where the safety line was attached to his belt was moving in small, almost invisible steps. I gulped. Uh, okay, Jack. Just tell me what to do. Jack measured his words. I can't see, Dumbo. 
I can't move. You've got to do it. You're on your own. Just grab my ankles. I'll do the rest. Sure, Jack. It's going to be okay. I've never had a person's life in my hands before. Their reputation for fashion and style, perhaps, but never their life. But at that very moment, a perverse thought occurred. Jack hadn't yet kept his part of the agreement we'd made earlier. He hadn't told me about Roger in the slide. No time like the present, I thought. Uh, Jack? I said innocently. What? What are you waiting for? Jack, we never got to talk about Roger. What? The rope slipped a half inch. Shit! muttered Jack. So, I was wondering... Damn you! What are you rambling about? Jack, talk to me nice. I said with the gentle persuasiveness of a toddler's television host. Tell me why that slide bothered Roger so much? What? You grab my ankles now. The rope had a baby slip. Jack, I want to help you, but first you have to help me. <laughs> Went Jack. Slip, slip with the rope on the belt. Why did Roger go to Boston? Damn you! Damn you! Jack? Slip. Okay, okay, he said. You got me by the balls. Not quite, Jack. Take my anchors and I'll tell you. Say it first. Slip, slip. I hate you, he yelled. Then a moment later, with a savage growl, he said, Roger thought someone blew up those rocks on purpose. So, it wasn't a natural slide. No! And that's why Roger went to Boston. Damn! Yes, that's why. What's in Boston? I don't know. Damn you fucker. Grab my ankles. Okay, Jack. I grabbed onto his ankles. And the instant I did, he curled himself up and grabbed onto the safety rope himself. Then he pulled himself up onto the ledge. He looked at me with a mean glare. That wasn't fair, he said. I had to know, Jack. He stood up and refastened his jeans. I said, didn't you at least enjoy the rush? The one you weren't expecting? He breathed heavily for a few moments while he reattached the safety line and felt good old terra firma under him again. After a few minutes of quiet fuming, he looked at me and, to my surprise, he smiled. You know, buddy, maybe you're right. Then he put his arm around my neck and pulled me toward him. I sure wasn't expecting that kind of rush. And now that I'm up here safe and sound with you, I confess it was real nice. Jack, I wasn't really going to let you fall, but I wondered how a person could be on the verge of death at one moment and at the next be sinking you, thanking you for the excitement of it. Was I unwittingly into heavy S&M? Getting down from the rocks was extremely easy since there was an alternate hiking route on the other side of the mountain. When we returned to the climbing school, Jack shook my hand and said, Thanks again for the rush, buddy. You gotta try climbing more. You're a natural. I'm still afraid of heights. Nah, you got used to it. Come by any time. Take you up again. I'm sure you would, I thought. It was after two o'clock when I got in the car. I drove back out to the main road and felt a burning soreness in my fingertips as I handled the steering wheel. Then it clicked, and I knew what had caused those strange calluses on Roger's fingertips. The rocks. As I drove from the school, I looked around for Udi. I wondered if he'd seen Jack and me and our Folies Jerry number up on the ledge. I assumed he'd be watching out for me along the road. He couldn't miss spotting the big red clunker I was driving in that national setting. I reached the main valley road without finding him. So I backtracked all the way to the climbing school again, but with no luck, I gave up and drove into the village hoping to find him along the way, but it didn't happen. Instead of searching any longer, I drove to the Alone Mot Hotel to keep my luncheon interrogation with Mr. Leonard. Now that I was armed with more information, I wanted to find out just how much he knew. Judy would have to understand that I didn't have time for hide-and-seek. 
a gay mysteries audiobooks. I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.